Brian has obviously never been in my class because everybody pays attention. <laughs> Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra, uh, professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Uh, today we are honored to have five candidates for mayor. As you all know, the election is on March 5th, exactly one month from today. Uh, we have a class, uh, several classes uh, attending this debate, uh, many of them themed on Los Angeles or urban issues, and it was the students themselves who have organized a large part of this debate, and they will be actually asking the questions. They've been doing a lot of reading from a variety of different academic books, a lot of uh, government documents, and they familiarize themselves with your backgrounds uh, and a lot of different information. And so they are, as uh, uh, ASLMU president said, Ruiz, the future of the city, and they're looking forward to this debate. I would briefly like to introduce uh, the candidates. I think many of you already know them. Their bios are listed on the uh, pamphlet that we handed out. Uh, right next to me is uh, Eric Garcetti, uh, council member of the 13th district. You can clap. This is the only time we're letting you clap. Uh, next to him is Wendy Gruel, uh, controller of the city of Los Angeles and former council member uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Wendy. <laughs> Uh, next to her is uh, Kevin James, former U.S. Uh, uh, attorney here in Los Angeles, former entertainment lawyer and form former talk show uh, host. Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Uh, next is uh, Jan Perry, a councilwoman from the 9th District. And next to her is Emmanuel Platis, a, a former high-tech executive. Now, I'm excited about not only this mayoral election, but this forum. I know many of these candidates for a long time. I think it is a, an incredible group of candidates, a great choice for the city of Los Angeles. I know that I've promised my vote to each one of them several times. And so, uh, I, and uh, my students are looking mu very much forward to this. Um, I'd like to actually ask the first student to come on up here and, and ask the very first question. What we're going to do in this first round is actually uh, have 45 seconds uh, per, uh, per uh, answer. And uh, this question goes to all five of the candidates. Again, alphabetical order just for because it makes it easy for us to keep track. We're going to start with Council Member uh, Eric Garcetti. Annalise? Hi. Um, is it your intention? Thank you, Annalise. Well, nice bell. I like it. Uh, and good evening, everybody. And thank you, Fernando, and, and to the wonderful LMU community for having us here today. Public safety, I come from a, a household that was raised uh, fighting for public safety. My father was a prosecutor, and I take very seriously that that is our first job. Proud to have led us to being the safest big city in America in terms of violent crime per capita. To me, numbers are often promised, but what's more important than a number is how many officers we have out on the street and in our communities at any given time. Because you can expand a force and you can see fewer of them out on the streets. In Hollywood, what made the difference in my district was 40 new police officers out on the streets every day that brought Hollywood, which used to be one of the worst places in Los Angeles, to being one of the safest places now, cut in two-thirds in violent crime. That allowed businesses to come back, and that allowed us to generate more tax revenues to do the things we need to do, whether it's new libraries, pave our streets, and make sure that we have more firefighters and police officers. So are you in favor of 10,000 force? I am in favor, and I fought hard for it, and would continue that at the very least as a baseline. Controller Gruel. Absolutely in favor of the 10,000, and today um, I uh, released uh, a, a plan, a goal of getting us up to, to 12,000 and getting up our fire department as well to 4,000 because I do believe the number of officers that we have in Los Angeles and the number of officers we have on our street are so critically important. I remember when I was on the budget committee and I said we needed to continue to hire officers. And the woman on the other side of the table said, well, you know what you're doing if you do this, right? And I said, yes. I'm making public safety a priority. Someone said to me today, well, we're uh, you know, safe in Los Angeles. Does it matter how many officers? Absolutely, because if you're a victim of crime, you want that officer to respond. You want to be able to have those officers on the street of Los Angeles. And what I propose is that we do it in a responsible way of looking at revenue and making sure we have enough money for the officers to be on our streets and to provide safety for our residents So of Los you're going Angeles. from 10 uh, Vera thousand and By 2020. May okay, and Mayor uh, Vera Gosa struggled mightily to get to the 10,000. So it, it was a struggle for him. Yes. Kevin. Well, 
and getting there uh, with Ms. Grohl's numbers, revenue projections that aren't just police. It's not about having 10,000 police officers or any target number. We have, it's about the number of officer hours in the community. Right now, if you talk to the rank and file, they'll tell you that they're spending two-thirds of their time behind the desk doing what is now largely unnecessary and outdated paperwork. With just some new technology and getting rid of some old outdated policies, well, we can increase the number of office hours, or officer hours in the community. And when you do that, then you increase public safety. We do so without adding any new police, so it costs the taxpayer nothing new, and you can increase the amount of time that the officers spend in the community without the new police department, without the new number of police officers. So 10,000, no increase. 10,000, no increase with the current budget. Councilwoman Perry. No, I would not increase uh, the size of the police force at this time because we don't have the money to pay for it. At the present time, we spend 70% of our budget on public and safety. If revenues come in, of course, as mayor, I'd be willing to dedicate more revenue to hire more police. Our crime levels are at an all-time low uh, over the last decade. So I think it gives us a chance to focus on what's important, what, what is important to build a good police force that is strategic, that d engages in constitutionally based policing, to use technology to enhance what we have here in the officers that we have now and to take care of their needs, to deal with our structural deficit. That's the greatest threat to our public safety, the structural deficit, which is driven by our pension system. So you would, you're in favor of 10,000, but not increasing it beyond that? I would not. I, we're almost at 10,000 now. You know, we're hovering at just under 10,000. Uh, I don't see the need to increase it until we have the revenues here <coughs> on deposit. Mr. Platus. Yeah. Uh, there's no need to increase the amount of uh, police officers. However, we need to rethink what public safety actually means. In fact, I want to double the size of public safety people. People that are actually in the communities working and intervening, especially in the lives of anyone that is showing signs that they could go down a troubled path. Look, when I grew up, I actually didn't like the police. I was afraid of them sometimes because we got stopped for no reason. We need to change the mindset and go, instead of from incarceration, to intervention and prevention. That's how we reform our public safety, the way we actually approach this problem. So it's not about more police officers, it's about more times in the communities, more community policing, and expanding our public safety force so we actually have community members that are actually helping with public safety, so it's not just a police officer's job. Okay, we have the next question from uh, Chris. Hello. Hi, Chris. How's it going? Good. Um, LAPD Police Chief Charlie Beck is up for reappointment. Knowing what you know today, would you support his reappointment? We'll start with uh, uh, Controller uh, Wendy Gruel. Absolutely. Uh, Chief Beck has been one of those uh, chiefs that I believe is rolled up his sleeves and said, let's look at not only the issue of having enough police officers on the street, and he supports increasing the number of officers, as Bill Bratton did when he first came in on as chief. But he also has been very focused on gang reduction programs, uh, engagement and making sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to stop kids from getting into gangs, stop kids from getting access to guns, and stop them from having access to drugs. Uh, I've been very proud of uh, supportive of him uh, when he was recommended to be the, the next chief after Chief Bratton and look forward to him being chief when I'm mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, Mr. James. Uh not so sure um, regarding Chief, uh, Chief Beck. Um, I believe he's allowed his office to be politicized in a way that is not best for the LAPD. Specifically regarding the impound policy, that's, he wanted to make that an immigration issue. I believe it's a public safety issue. People that are driving on our streets without driver's license, that is a public safety issue. A car can be a killing machine if it is not operated properly with someone who has had the proper training. So for that reason, um, along with every other department head, one of the things I bring, because I bring a level of independence to this race, not beholden to the special interests like my opponents, I bring a level of independence that means that new department heads across the city must reapply for their jobs, and, and that means all of the department heads. And it takes a level of independence to do that, and I will do so. Some we will keep, but some will certainly be replaced. Councilwoman Jan Perry. I've had the pleasure of working with Charlie Beck as the former 
head of uh, command in uh, South Bureau and in robbery homicide over the last 11 years, so I know firsthand his hands-on style, his pragmatic approach to policing, his deep relationships with people's communities, his belief in the strength of the senior lead officer program and reaching deeply into people's communities and understanding what they need and making sure that his officers meet those needs. And so I wouldn't hesitate to reappoint him. I think he's done an excellent job of bridging the gap into many people's communities in a way that has contributed to the decrease in violent crime across the city. Mr. Platus. I support uh, Charlie Beck. Uh, look, he's someone that, that's come out of the rank and file of the police department and uh, he's moving our police department in the right direction. However, when I become mayor, I want to work with uh, Chief Beck so that we actually are using uh, better technology and better use of our data so that we have more specific tr strategies for anywhere where there could be a spike in crime. And we are responding in a more dynamic way to the needs of our city. Also, I want to make sure, like I said before in the previous question, that we're changing the mindset and we're moving towards more prevention, intervention, and police officers are really about community policing. And we're expanding programs such as the Senior Lead Officer Program so that where they're more present in the community, building relationships, and actually going to the root of any crime that exists in our city. Thank you. Mr. Garcetti. Uh, thank you. When I was uh, a one week uh, into my term council member, Charlie Beck was captain at Rampart Division, which had just been embroiled in scandal that almost brought down LAPD. And he did a brilliant job. I still believe today he was the finest captain I worked with. But I'm, I'm glad to hear Mr. James say what I've been talking about for a year and a half, that as mayor, all of my uh, managers and all of my chiefs will reapply for their jobs and will do this publicly. Because I think it's not just me hiring those folks who run the city, it's you all hiring and paying that taxpayer money there. But he's done a brilliant job in looking at gang intervention, uh, gun violence. I think he has stepped up on immigration and I allowed him for that immigration issues to say it's time to bring people out of the shadows and into the light. He certainly has my confidence and if it were today, I'll make that final decision and I would certainly renominate him. Um, but I'll be doing that with the public in an open, transparent way that opens up City Hall to all of us. So by charter, the police chief does have to apply for reappointment, right. but the other general managers do not. So how would you make them reapply, if they, especially if they don't want to? Well, under the charter, which was strengthened for the mayor, it, we have the power now for a mayor to hire and to fire all general managers other than those that have commission protection. So I will be asking them to reapply. Right. It's essentially your cabinet, and I don't remember Obama saying, give me George W. Bush's cabinet, or George W. Bush saying, give me Clinton's cabinet. It's the one moment you can bring in your team. Many of them are very good, as was said, and I'll probably rehire them, but right. some of them... But the city council would be able to overturn... Over, they could overturn right. it, correct. Okay, let's get the next question from uh, Natalie Reynoso. Recently, Police Chief Beck announced that undocumented immigrants arrested for low-level crimes would no longer be turned over to federal authorities for deportation. Do you agree or disagree with his decision? Mr. James. Ah, well, we're still on this topic. Um, and let me say, uh, regarding Chief Beck, uh, I did have uh, uh, the opportunity to, to work with Chief Beck when we exposed the rape kit backlog that was happening in Los Angeles. He did great work. Um, in, uh, in getting there uh, to eliminate the backlog that, uh, that city government allowed to grow. Your question, though, is uh, regarding the low-level crimes uh, and the, the, what was essentially the Safe Cities program. Um, I do not agree with Chief Beck's policy because what you're doing, I understand the, uh, the concept of not wanting to turn people over for a low-level crime. But the problem is, if the federal government has an, immigration on hold, has an immigration hold on them for a reason, and we don't know what that reason is, it might be something serious. And it's very risky, if it's something serious, to turn them back over to the community. So for that reason, I do not agree with the policy that he put in place. Councilwoman Perry. I actually agree with Chief Beck. Again, I said he had a very hands-on style, and I think he understands the fine nuances of blended families. Some people in a family are here legally, and others are not. Uh, having worked in South Los Angeles and representing a community that was 70% Latino, and talking with, communicating with LAPD was absolutely critical when people's cars were impounded or uh, taken from them because they did not have driver's licenses. It was potentially devastating for people 
uh, to lose their car, to be able to take pe children to and from school, to be able to go to work, and to do the things that you normally do to have a decent quality of life here. And so I think that uh, the chief practical, a practical approach to encourage people, again, to come forward and to be more engaged civically and not feel that they have to hide uh, at every turn and to, you know, become better participants in our city life. Mr. Platas. So I, I am absolutely not for deportation of low-level crimes. In fact, uh, one of the reasons I grew up without a father is because uh, when my father was here, he was always afraid of being deported and he moved to Canada and where there was a different policy. Um, I want to make sure that we treat all Angelinos as Angelinos, regardless of what country they were born in. If they're here to work, then we need to treat them the same and ha make sure that they have access to the same city services. And for low-level crimes, we have policies in order. We need to make sure that they can come out of the shadows and that they're working and contributing to their communities here. So I support Chief Beck in how he has treated this situation. Councilman Garcetti. I agree wholeheartedly with the chief and advocated for him to take that position uh, before he did and embraced it once he did. I want my police to be focused on serious crimes here. And it doesn't prevent, by the way, checks to see whether there's serious holds. It just means that they won't be uh, handed over to immigration. For us, I've been an advisor to President Obama. We have a moment right now for comprehensive immigration reform. And look, we have hundreds of thousands of our fellow residents here in this city that we need to be able to incorporate into our society. And we do that by things like the matricula consular, which is a consular card. I wrote the legislation to recognize that and to make sure that could be used as a form of identification. I want to know who's living here. I want them to be able to go to a library. I want somebody who's studying hard, who's a dreamer like my grandfather who came here and for 30 years was not a citizen, did not have documents until he volunteered to fight in World War II and came back as a citizen. That is the American dream. We need to write more chapters of that, not close the book on people. Controller Gruel. Thank you, and uh, I support uh, Chief Beck's decision on this as well. Um, we've had Special Order 40 in Los Angeles since the 1970s. Um, it has been uh, something over the years that has been debated back and forth, but primarily what every police chief has indicated, uh, no matter what their political persuasion, was wanting to make sure that victims of violent crime and others felt as though they could access that police uh, force and those police officers and not be stopped just because of the color of their skin. And so this message, what the police chief is saying, is working uh, together, um, working on issues that make Los Angeles the kind of city we want to have it, where there is a pathway to citizenship, where there is a place where young people who've come can be part of that dream and that dream act, and making sure that we create a neighborhoods that are safe, but more importantly, that they can trust the police. Because we've seen over the years that that hasn't always been the case. Next question is from Maynard Kamei. <clears throat> Should the city of LA make ID cards available for its residents, including undocumented Im immigrants? Councilwoman Perry. Yes, I think the city of Los Angeles should make some form of identification uh, available for people who are not documented. Um, because again, the point of all of this, the driver's licenses for people who are not documented, uh, being engaged with LAPD and making sure that people are able to live a quality of life is to pull people forward into the process of civic engagement so that eventually they will be able to get a driver's license, they will be able to be more mainstream and they will not have to live in fear and it, be, it builds a, a stronger community in the long run. I know that having represented South Los Angeles for quite a while that when people work together the schools get better, uh, civic activities are stronger, test scores rise when everybody is engaged and supportive of each other. Mr. Platas. I absolutely support ID cards. I think it's along the same lines as what I've also already said. Like we need to bring people out of the shadows and uh, make them feel proud of being an Angelino and contribute to our communities and be part of the fabric of what does make Los Angeles Los Angeles. Look, my mom crossed the border and pregnant with me. At some point, uh, she wasn't documented herself. And we've had certain policies throughout the years that have helped families like this, and we need to continue moving forward in a progressive way so that we bring people out of the shadows and we allow them to contribute to their communities. Councilman Garcetti. Uh, thank you, Maynard, for the question. And absolutely, not only do I to recognize what in council, and we're moving forward with this idea, and to recognize what before I authored the legislation to recognize what's called consular cards, matricula consulares, uh, cards that we've now 
allowed to the LAPD to get together with uh, consul generals like um, from Korea, from Mexico, from El Salvador to know what those forms of identification are so that people can feel confident when they're a witness to a crime, going to a police station and saying who they are and that they witnessed something, going to a library and getting a library card to make their lives better. But secondly, as mayor, I will establish or reestablish, I helped it happen under Mayor Hahn, an office of immigrant affairs in the mayor's office. New York City has this. Great cities have these offices to help bring people in who are new arrivals to the city to get to be a part of the civic life and to contribute. And we need comprehensive immigration reform, as I mentioned, a pathway to citizenship. It means that we'll get more taxes, we'll get more college grads, we'll get more entrepreneurs and jobs and safer communities. Controller Gruel. Uh, yes, I support uh, ID cards in, in Los Angeles. Uh, again, when we look at the city of LA and the diversity of, is our strength, and that, as someone talked about, driver's license and others, I, I have to tell you, I want to make sure that people who are driving in our communities have a driver's license and know how to drive and have an insurance. We need to make sure that they have the access, as mentioned, to, to the library and other places so that we don't um, put, push them into the shadows. We have bipartisan support now on immigration reform on a national level, which is what we need to continue to push for. Because if you read any of the articles, see any of the news stories, um, there are individuals who are coming to uh, our country to work, and there's need by many of the businesses. So immigration reform, identification, so the police and others and, the, and those individuals will not be running away because they don't have the kind of identification to say who they are and where they're from. Okay, Kevin. So the last two questions, it was 4-1. You weren't so <laughs> sure about reappointing uh, Chief Beck. You weren't so sure about uh, turning immigrants over to federal authorities. Here's the third one. Let's see if, how, how you do see on, how I on do this. Here? Yeah. You know, if you want to understand just how broken our federal immigration system is, you'll do like I did. You'll go through Naleo, which is the, as you know, Dr. Gere, National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, through their training, uh, as I did as an attorney to work with their organization as a pro bono lawyer and their immigration and naturalization workshops where I sit at a table and you'll watch people that line up out the door and around the building to get help coming to our country to, uh, to immigrate and to go through the naturalization process, which I've done a number of times. Um, and you see just how much we do need comprehensive immigration reform. That said, um, I will uh, be the only one that will disagree with the ID card. I disagree with the city ID card because, number one, it's not the business that the city should be in. And number two, along a, a whole list of other issues, it creates a liability for the city. If so, it's a domestic passport then. If someone goes into another county, another state, and uses that ID card, and they get hired for a child care job, and then something tragic happens, you're setting the city up for liability because they relied on that card. Okay, we have a next question from Ileana de Guzman. Posed an early warning... Recently, State Senator Alex Padilla proposed an early warning system for earthquakes. Do you support this? If the state doesn't fund it, would you support the city funding it for a warning system for the city of L.A. only? Mr. Platas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, I support it. Look, any, any uh, system that allows for the better use of technology or any science or correlations that we, that we understand do lead to some causation, uh, we need to use it. Look, my background is a technology company executive. I worked for a company that handled billions of records. And I worked with public safety departments, police departments, sheriffs, homeland security departments, state, the State Department, uh, federal departments uh, uh, across the whole administration on using our data in a, more, in a better way, in a more efficient way, so that we can come up with better strategies, whether it's emergency response or patrolling on the streets. That's my background, and absolutely, I will work to make sure that we use our better data and we use better response systems. Okay. Councilman? I hope all of us better uh, support this. We live in California, and obviously mm -hmm. this would be something that all of us should embrace. In fact, today in City Council, we in introduced a motion in support of Senator Padilla's uh, legislation. Whether we could pay for it here in the city of Los Angeles, I've seen those estimates, absolutely not. We don't have that sort of money unless we got grants from the federal government or the state. So if they didn't go the city of LA with this budget situation would not be prepared to go on our own, but we should encourage the state to do so. 
And to Manuel's point about looking at different technology that we can use, we can use early warning systems in a whole host of areas. Been a strong proponent of reverse 911 to let people know when there's emergencies that calls you proactively when things are happening in your neighborhood. They can get down now to the granular level to your own block if there's a fire or some sort of emergency. Uh, smartphone apps that I'd like to do something called a hackathon, which allows programmers to come in and develop apps with the data that we Senator improve the quality of our lives and make it safer. Controller. Uh, I, I support Senator Padilla's bill. He's been a great supporter of mine, endorsed me for my uh, mayor's uh, race uh, today. But I think there's several things that I want to point out. One, um, I talked about today in my safety plan about ensuring that we created neighborhood emergency prepared preparedness plans. I was here in 1994 when uh, working for the Department of Housing, Urban Development and President Clinton and was responsible for coordinating the efforts of a billion dollars for bringing housing back to our communities. I was here in 1987 uh, when the Whittier earthquake happened and I worked for Mayor Tom Bradley in the kind of response that we were doing here in Los Angeles and of course I was in fourth grade in 1971 when we had the earthquake. I've seen them all. But it is important that we not only be prepared, that we use our, the public in those neighborhood neighborhood programs and our CERT programs, and that we also ensure that we have someone as mayor who understands who's been there during a crisis like I have during that 1994 earthquake. Kevin? Um, yes, I do support it. Um, you know, the mayor serves as the director of emergency operations in the city of Los Angeles. And our budget crisis has severely hampered our ability to be ready for a major earthquake. And that budget crisis, of course, continues. I was at the port recently uh, meeting with some folks that uh, have some amazing technology that is actually being implemented now at the uh, Port of Long Beach that we need here in the Port of Los Angeles. And I learned that if we have a major earthquake, you know we have three days, three days of fuel supply here in the city of Los Angeles. Now that's pretty scary. And the fact that we have allowed this budget crisis to get out of hand can only exacerbate the danger that we face in the event of what we know is not a question of if, but when. Councilwoman. The concept uh, that Senator Padilla has put on the table for, for, in front of us is one that is uh, very present in everyone's mind each and every day. But for me, the question is whether or not the city should administer a program like that. The city can be a stronger and more strategic partner in a statewide network of emergency preparedness and participate in an early warning system strategy. But I don't know whether the city should be responsible for administering that until I know how much it costs and where the source of funding would come from. Okay, the next question is from Valerie DeSanto. Valerie? What can the mayor do to control gun violence in Los Angeles? Thank you, Valerie. And, and all of us uh, feel that impact, not just when you see tragedies like Newtown, but when we also feel that steady drip of killings that happens here in this city because of gun violence. Um, as many of us have said up here, it's easier to get a gun than it is to get mental health care in this country. We have so many of our guns that are being illegally obtained. For instance, we have folks who are straw buyers in the city of Los Angeles who, when warned that it's illegal to buy a gun for someone else and had already paid for their weapon, in that 10-day waiting period when we tried this, almost half of them didn't even come back for their gun. That's how many illegal guns there are. I have a very strong record of passing some of the strongest laws that we have here in the nation, and Los Angeles is certainly an example for that. But in terms of being prepared, we need to intervene early on in people's lives. When a 16-year-old girl in my own district was killed a block and a half from a park when somebody rolled up to her while she was walking with her boyfriend and shot her in the back, we created a program that's led to summer night lights, which has reduced crime by 40%, saved lives. It's those programs as much as getting the guns out of the hands that make a difference. Controller. Well, you know, when we, we look at it, and I, I use the phrase actually, um, we, when we're all standing up here, we start to say each other's words. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, when we were at the League of Conservation Voters, it said it is easier uh, to get a gun than, than it is to get mental health services. And that new town is our town. That there are actions of gun violence every single day in our communities. We have to. And I have to, as the next mayor of Los Angeles, stand up and say, yes, we support Senator Feinstein's ban on assault weapons. Yes, we support loopholes that don't allow, that still allow you to get them in the, um, the, the gun shows and not have to go through the kinds of background checks. That we need to, as a city of Los Angeles, stand up and say, enough is enough. And make sure that our kids do not have access to that gun, those guns. As someone's family who's been impacted by gun violence, I get it and understand that that should be a priority of the next mayor is to use every 
ounce of energy that we have to ensure that gun violence does not impact each and every one of our neighborhoods. Mr. James. One of the things the mayor can do here in the city, of course, is for concealed uh, carry weapons applications in connection with the LAPD, close any kind of background loophole, number one. Number two, we have to make our schools safer. That's something that the mayor can do uh, in partnership with the LAUSD. And, you know, danger in schools is not just guns being brought in, but the reason that guns are being brought in on occasion. We have gang activity, too much of that related to the schools. We also have a bullying epidemic. And the bullying epidemic is a serious problem. Uh, we also have drug use in the schools. And if we can some of ill on the early side with some of those crises in our schools, then we can increase the safety level of the schools that will lessen the reason for guns to even be brought into the facility to begin with. Councilwoman. Thank you. I think you'll find that most Democrats will say that they uh, support Feinstein's ban on assault weapons. I wanted to try something different. So I introduced a motion, and I believe we will be discussing it tomorrow on the public record, uh, about the proliferation of guns in our communities and to make sure that companies that manufacture guns and ammunition do not profit from our employee retirement contributions. I drew my inspiration from years of reading Klan Watch, the former director, uh, Morris Dees, who broke the chain of commerce uh, for hate crimes in the South. I felt that this might be a different approach that we could take uh, to, to be more, more innovative and more hands-on to disrupt that so that it would be clear that Los Angeles is not a place where you can get a weapon. Emmanuel. Look, I support the assault weapons ban. We need more, we need stricter background checks and we need to close the loopholes so we can't be buying guns at gun shows. And we need more thorough mental health evaluations. Um, we need to treat mental health with compassion and understanding and, not, and remove the stigma. However, all that is not enough because people can still get guns. In fact, uh, just two weeks ago, five minutes before I dropped off my cousin in my neighborhood of El Sereno, someone was shot and killed in front of a taco truck that I frequent. Last year, there were multiple drive-bys right across the street from where I live. Growing up, my best friend was a victim of gang violence. I feel the urgency to solve this, and the way we do it is getting at the root of the cause and creating more positive outlets for our young people and changing the culture to intervention and prevention, not incarceration. That's how we deal with this, and we need to be in the communities in, in a more forceful way by intervening in the lives of our young people. Our next question is from uh, Lauren. Good evening. Um, given that water is integral to LA's vitality and prosperity and that it's a finite resource requiring importation via the LA aqueduct to meet our astronomical demand, what are your plans to make LA a more sustainable city and what uh, reforms would you propo propose to DWP um, in that attempt? Controller Gruel. Thank you uh, very much. And it is a critical issue. Um, I was proud, uh, before I left on the City Council, to introduce the motion on uh, low-impact development, uh, particularly looking at how do we ensure that we're not having this kind of impact in our communities, and one of those being the amount of water that is used in each of our uh, homes and businesses. When you think about it, um, right now, people say, well, there's no water problem. You know, DWP, a few years ago, it was, we're going to not water our lawns on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then, of course, what happened, whether it was attached or not, we had a lot of, uh, of our pipes break during that time, and was that because everyone was doing it at the same time. Um, we have to look not only at our own uh, efficiencies that we do here, we have to look at capturing. I uh, worked very closely capturing the water, worked with uh, tree people and some of the cisterns that we've been able to create, and that we have to look at innovative ways and l ask Department of Water and Power to be much more creative and think outside the box, not only again in efficiencies, but capture of water and how we use our water in the city of Los Angeles. Mr. James. Yes, the question for some ideas uh, in dealing with our water crisis. Um, stormwater capture, of course, one way to do that is through technology that's available through pervious concrete. Um, also, uh, something else that is, uh, that's available now, uh, gray water, uh, gray water permits. We've got to make it easier for people that want to use gray water around their home uh, to be able to do so. Uh, also, desalination uh, is something that should be looked at. Desalination, uh, you know, we, we're right next to the Pacific Ocean. Desalination plants can be expensive and they can be a drain on the power supply. But there are new technologies that relate to desalination um, that can avoid some of the environmental concerns. So desalination, gray water permits, and streamlining those permits, 
and using pervious concrete and other available technologies for stormwater capture. Councilwoman. Several years ago, the city of Los Angeles, the voters, passed a clean water bond. It was called Proposition O. It enabled us to be able to bond, to build projects that were not only, not only captured stormwater runoff, but were green spaces, recreation spaces, teaching spots for schools, and a place to show native California plants, but most of all, it made our city more porous, more able to capture water, to recharge the uh, ground water, and to make a healthier environment. I know this for a fact because I've been able to reclaim two spaces in South Los Angeles. One, a 10-acre bus yard in, at 54th and Avalon, and turn it into a 10-acre wetland so it's, it's a natural habitat for birds and wildlife and an outdoor classroom for the schools in the immediate area. And it makes it much more, uh, m makes the city a much greener place. Mr. Aplatus. Yep. Look, we, de we need to better manage our water supply and capture more of it and, and look at technologies such as, such as uh, desalination and, and other technologies. What's really going on here, though, is focusing on DWP. And we need to stop using it as a piggy bank to cover up the budget mistakes for politicians and actually use it to invest in these technologies so that we are better managing our water supply. We need to allow more private ventures, more entrepreneurs to actually help us manage our water supply, but increase cleaner technologies into our city. I only want to support any type of rate increase or any type of spending by DWP where we're focusing on making our city a more sustainable city instead of using it to cover up for any mistakes of the past. Mr. Garcetti. I've strongly focused on water in my 11 years. It's not just what I would do, but what we have done. Um, both Ms. Perry and I uh, authored and got through Proposition O, which was the largest clean water bond in the nation's history. Instead of suing back when Heal the Bay sued us for sewer spills that used to go into the ocean right out here. I said, why don't we try to fix this? And we put that on the ballot and it passed. We need to reduce, we need to reuse, we need to recharge. First, reducing. I authored the largest green building ordinance in this, in this country that helps us reduce through the fixtures that we have in our bathrooms and our kitchens, the amount of water that we use. Secondly, recharging. Unpaving streets, part of Propo has been something called green streets. We all know in those neighborhoods where the water gathers and it just sits there and then washes out dirtily, we take it instead and unpave and put it back into the ground. And then to recharge, to make sure that we have recycled water in our homes and other places. And I put a plan forward for 20,000 new jobs, of which a big chunk is around cleaning up our water and reducing water use, reducing your water bill at home so, as well. Uh Depaving our streets, is that what all the potholes are about? <laughs> Absolutely. It's the, only, it's the only upside to that. Yes. And the next question is by Sloan. <laughs> California is largely considered to be the home of the green energy boom. Under your administration, what role will Los Angeles play in the green, green energy industry? Yeah, can I start with me? You know, okay, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, lot, sorry, that's cool. Uh, Los Angeles, of course, has to be a leader in the, uh, in the green technology boom. We've let too many of these jobs go away. You know, we were asked at a debate recently, uh, well, these green jobs, are they, uh, are, are the numbers adding up? And in Los Angeles, we've gotten to the point that we need to find any job uh, as opposed to just green jobs. But in prior debates, as I have set forth, there are a number of technologies that are available that will create jobs here and now. I talked earlier about my meeting at the port. That was in connection with the advanced maritime emission control system that will create lots of jobs, union jobs here too that emissions capture from chips, chips coming into the port. Fuel cell technologies that are available to, uh, to run the electricity in your home. Geothermal technology that's available to heat and cool your home. All jobs right here. But city government has failed so much that UCLA put out a report, Vision 2021, and criticized the city for not having a sustainability plan ever. We don't read much from UCLA here, but so. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Councilwoman. Okay, I, yes. I need to be very mindful of where I am right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I thought it was USC you had the beef with, Dr. Gare. No, that's, yeah, that's the councilwoman's a USC grad. Yeah, he's a loyal. He's a loyal. He's loyal to where he, he is. Uh, to uh, to, to my that. paycheck. Yes. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> yes. Green energy, emerging technologies, working with community colleges, making sure the curriculum is tailored towards those emerging technologies in the green field are a very direct way to put people back to work and to do it quickly. The city should encourage the growth of those kinds of businesses. One of the best ways the city can encourage that is to work with venture capital companies, 
install or put in fiber optic grids in areas where there needs to be more growth, where there is no longer a redevelopment agency or tax increment to invest, and make it easier for startups and independents and entrepreneurs to go in and not have to worry as much about front end capital and encourage the growth of these companies so that they can hire people and put people back to work. Mr. Platus. Look, we have the potential to be the first truly sustainable city uh, in the U.S., but we're only going to get there if the, my, the mayor prioritizes the interests of consumers before special interests. Okay? When we look at the DWP, it's right now monopolizing the provision of energy sources, of energies for our city. What we need to do is make sure that we open up the market so we allow more private enterprise, private capital to actually enter the market and provide more energy for the city. Look, this is something I worked on when I was uh, working in the U.S. Department of the Treasury and the White House, where I actually worked with the executives, heads of labor unions, to come up with solutions. We came up with the home retrofit program. That needs to be expanded throughout in, in all cities around the country, and I will lead that here as mayor of L.A. so that we can expand that program, make it more accessible, create more green jobs in the community, especially where it matters most, in the most underserved communities throughout the city. I was very proud last week to receive the endorsement of the Sierra Club, uh, one of the most meaningful endorsements to me personally and, and in this race in, in recognition of the work I've done in this area, Sloan, and, and thank you for asking about it. As mayor, I will finish the work that I started in 2002 when we were the first vote ever to divest from a coal plant which has dirty, uh, planet-destroying energy, and we're going to move DWP completely off of coal production. How are we going to do that? First, we're going to make this the solar capital. The feed-in tariff that I worked on, Ms. Perry worked on, to help us get through to put solar on our rooftops, I've embraced a 1,200 megawatt goal, which is about a third of the power generated here that we can get to, um, a place that is here, in-basin, clean, efficient, and long-term cheaper. Second, look at energy efficiency, how we can reduce the energy use in our own homes and our businesses. And my 20,000 green jobs plan, a big chunk of that is putting people back to work, helping us reduce our bills while at the same time reducing our energy use as well. Wendy? You know, uh, creating green technology, making sure we're the creative capital on green technology is critically important. It's a win-win. First of all, it's the right thing to do, to be able to have renewable energy, to improve our, our air, and to be able to ensure that we're improving the, the world as we see it. But it's also about creating jobs. It's creating those linkages with our community colleges and four-year universities, and yes, having those jobs of the future. As the only candidate up here who has actually audited DOP and said, you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough to make sure we have renewable energy. And that it's not only a smart thing to do, but it is a responsible and fiscally responsible thing to do. When we look at our future, it is about solar, it is about getting off of coal, and it's making sure that we create the jobs of the future and providing the kind of incentives that are critically important. I do want to say when you joke about the water, just so that, you know, we live in a city where our streets aren't paved, but our rivers are. And so we need to look, as we look at our LA River that's paved, and how you capture that. I'll remember that. Uh, you can that, use that. You can yeah, use that in the future. Yeah. The next question is from, uh, uh, yeah, from, uh, from Jeremy. What specific actions would you take to cure the city's structural budget deficit, which has consistently exceeded $200 million per year? Councilwoman. Well, uh, let me cut directly to the chase. The hardest part of dealing with our structural deficit is to get our employees back to the table and ask them to give back more on their pensions and on their health care costs. Everything else is just window dressing. That is the most difficult because that is the one thing that most public employee unions do not want to do. Police and fire pay the highest amount on their health care costs and contribute the most to their pensions. All the other public employee unions should do the same. If we do that, and I want to be conservative in my numbers, we will save up front over $40 million. Okay, so it's $200 million. That's $40 million. So where would... It's a start. It's okay. just a start. You know, we have to fight for our gas tax, our property tax, our transit occupancy tax, uh, sales tax. Um, and, of course, every mayor should do that. That's your job. And, of course, every mayor should fight for more revenue. That's your job, too. But this is the most, most difficult part of bringing in more revenue. Emmanuel? Yeah, look, it, it's, it's difficult because we lack the courage and the leadership that we need in City Hall. $40 million, it's nothing. 
Uh, we're $200 plus million dollars in deficit this year, and next year we're going to have another $200 plus million. This is one of the principal reasons why I'm running is because we have lack of leadership in City Hall to address these issues. In fact, they made decisions based on numbers they didn't understand a number of years ago. And now, although they've already regretted their mistakes, they need to propose solutions. I propose an actual solution that's outside the box, innovative, first of its kind. We're going to do a pension buyout to relieve the liabilities off of our balance sheet and make sure that workers actually get something today instead of nothing tomorrow. I'm tired of the overpromises by our politicians. We need to fix our budget crisis and make sure we're on a path to solvency. And lastly, yes, we do need to look at other revenue generators by investing specifically in the most impoverished areas in our city and getting people that are hungry to work back to work. Emmanuel, I'm going to do a uh, moderator's privilege because my students did ask me. They heard you talk about pension buyout yeah. and I couldn't explain it. So <laughs> what is a pension buyout? Um, well, Look, this is actually the, the, the specific reason why we need someone with finance background, with a cross-sector no, experience, to be able to do it, to be able to explain and come up with these solutions. Um, look, essentially, you go to the bond market, you raise capital, right? Then you restructure the pension system by providing workers an option to cash out today, right? Right now, we have a bunch of liabilities, a bunch of things we owe money on that we can't even value because. They so change every year. In the, we will owe money to workers in the future. Let's borrow the money, pay them up front, yep. pay that, and it'll, that, that will be cheaper. We have historically low rates. I'd rather okay. fix grab Has any rates city right done now. that before? Huh? Has any city done no, that before? No, there's private companies that have done that, okay. but no cities have done, okay. done that. Structural deficit. Thank you. I, I don't need to propose solutions because I've enacted solutions and shown the will to be able to make those tough choices in our toughest times. $200 million deficit that we have was projected to be a billion dollar deficit this year. Four years ago it was projected we would be bankrupt in five years. While some sat on the sidelines and others, you know, saw the house burning and didn't do anything, I leapt into that fire and did the hard work which is why I think some of the public sector unions haven't lined up behind my campaign, but why I can also have the independence to show that we actually did the hard work. Pension reform, hundreds of millions of dollars of it, reducing the number of workers we have by 5,000, and yes, enacting out-of-pocket payments for the first time for health care. I've shown the ability to do that, but I don't think that taxes and cuts are the way forward. So what you also have in my candidacy is a proven job creator, somebody who in the midst of a recession in my district has added jobs. That has to be the solution or else we'll come here fighting over what we're going to cut for years to come if we don't make this a business-friendly city again, abolish our gross receipts tax, which businesses get chased away from our city, and make sure that it is easier to start a business in what, this what town about, once again. What uh, about Mr. Platus's pension buyout? Do you like that idea? If, no, if nobody, I, I'm sure, to have options, but my suspicion is a lot of our workers wouldn't say yes. It's that guarantee of a pension. Then what? But do they're we not do? forced to say yes. Absolutely. It's, it's, In fact, we've given we're looking at 401ks as an option for some engineers that want that, but only when they want it will it actually be any savings. And we're looking at hundreds of millions of and dollars. What about Mrs. Perry's? Um comment about renego going back to the table and renegotiating. Well, well I did that. When Ms. Perry talks about it being at 11%, that was negotiations I led. And actually, our civilian, not just police and fire, now do pay 11%. They used to pay as small as 2% of their salaries out of pocket for life um, health care and a guaranteed but pension. But she's suggesting that you go back and e get even further well, I think she said 11, so we actually do have the 11% in okay. for our non-fire and police, but absolutely those unions that aren't paying necessarily out of pocket for their health care, a small bit, you have to have some skin in the game because when health care costs triple, they don't feel it. Okay. Ms. Perry? I said fire and police, respectively, 10% and 11%, and I believe that I said health care and pension. The other, some of the unions, uh, some unions in our city uh, don't pay anything, and they're subsidized by the city of Los Angeles. We were all part of the so negotiating which, which body. Unions, which unions don't pay anything until they're health uh, care? Non-police and fire. Uh, I, I, so I, I don't, don't want to be inaccurate, so I, I'm not going to okay. pull a name but out in, of that. But in principle, you're suggesting that yes, there are some unions correct. that pay less than police and fire, and you yes. would like those unions to, to pay the same. To that standard. Okay. And, and, and I just like Whether, the, whatever the numbers yeah. are, that in principle is That's what right. you're suggesting. That's correct. Uh, um, Controller Gruel, uh, the structural deficit. Thank you. There are three things you need to do to fix the structural deficit. And, and if anyone says there's a magic bullet, there isn't. It, it takes hard work and we have to stop the cycle of layoffs and budget cuts and make sure that we're able to provide the services. But most importantly, first and foremost, is the mayor being the job czar. That's what I will be. Creating jobs creates a, a better economy, provides more money. 
uh, we're a better tourism location. We have businesses who are moving here. They pay sales tax and they create opportunities for workers in the future. It's also about pension reform and yes, everything being on the table and sitting across from those labor unions and saying, how do we get out of this? Not just for new employees, but working towards working across the table and existing employees of looking at pension spiking, double dipping, looking at uh, caps on pension, looking at a variety of ways and there's models all across this county that we can do. And the third thing, of course, would be efficient the kinds of things that I have identified as the city controller in ways in which we can ensure not only that we not lose money in the past, but not lose money in the future. So uh, how about, again, going back to Councilwoman Perry's idea about renegotiating and getting $40 million. Are you in favor of doing that? Absolutely. Everything has to be on the table. And the labor leaders that I have spoken to in every situation have said, you're going to have to come back to the table. Yeah, and I kind of like Emmanuel's pension buyout plan. Not that I understand it, but it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, uh, do, do you understand it? Well, as a city controller, and when I'm looking at our pension systems, um, I think there's a lot of details that would have to actually be explained before so you could endorse that something that you like understand? that. Because I don't understand your question. Do you understand his pension buyout? Uh, <laughs> not as he has described it thus far. So um, and more details would be more than happy to look at it um, within the city of Los Angeles to be able to with my but in principle, controller. It sounds like, it sounds like a good report. idea. Again, you have to look. The devil okay. is in the details. Oh, oh, the, the I'm the devil. controller, remember? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a Catholic university. We're used to dealing with the devil. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a segue to get to you, Kevin. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the setup, Dr. Garrett. <laughs> I appreciate that. I guess I get a little extra time yes. now for that yeah. in exchange. Yeah. Uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to solve this pension problem with jobs, why haven't they been the jobs are in the last 12 years that they've been in office? They have run, they have run business out of here. They've chased the entertainment industry away, number one. Number two, Ms. Perry makes a very accurate comment when she says that what we need to do is bring our city employee unions to the table. It's not just for pension reform. The question was about the deficit. Mm -hmm. It's also about salary reform. Now, they've been in office for 12 years, and we're still asking this question, and we still have the same kind of deficits. Who on this stage has 25 years as a lawyer with negotiating experience who is completely independent of these special interest unions who has the leverage to deal with them at arm's length and will bring them in all together at once. I have the communication skills to go around the city council to get pension reform if we need to. I'm the only candidate in this race that supported Mayor Reardon's plan. And I'll tell you something else. The new mayor has a new type of bankruptcy that was given by my opponents in City Hall. Excuse me, so, a new type of leverage. Okay, Kevin, and it's I've called given you, bankruptcy. Uh, a time and a half. But let me ask you this, though. Uh, salary reductions. Why would anybody give up salary reductions when they don't have to? It's already a contract. Well, I, um, I, I know that uh, when the uh, provost called me into his office last time for uh, yeah. what I thought was going to be merit pay, uh, they talked about something else, and I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't have to give that back. Why, why would I do that? To keep the city out of bankruptcy, Dr. Guerra, if we have 3% cuts across the board, uh, just to get us out of this fiscal disaster, um, and that brings the entire family in together. Mr. Garcetti was talking about people having skin in the game. This is something that we need to solve the problem now. And we have a road map, ladies and gentlemen. We have a road map to what can happen in this city. It's called San Bernardino. They have filed for bankruptcy. Cowper's filed a lawsuit to force them to pay into Cowper's when they had stopped. Imagine so the stress right of those there, retirees. And they lost that round. Yeah. Um, so what, let me just, Mr. Platus's pension buyout. Yes. You in favor of that? Uh, no, let me tell you what concerns me about it. That's the, a yes or no. The word, well, the word borrow. We have a $9.9 .9 billion yeah. dollar unfunded liability, and they want to borrow to, to, to give these choices. Let me tell you something else that we've got. But it would be you cheaper borrow to, the, to, to pay the, that down. The idea would be that it'd be cheaper even than Yes. So, in principle. It, it, okay. It hey, let me go. Uh, Kevin mentioned bankruptcy. A very quick yes or no. Shocker, Do right? you believe that we're close to bankruptcy, Councilwoman? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Eric? We have continuing problems, but absolutely not close to bankruptcy Wendy? today. 
No, bankruptcy is a cop, but you can do things now to make sure it doesn't happen. So I'll give you no, three things, Dr. Garrett, that can take us well, into wait, bankruptcy. Wait, the, All right? One second, We've got we have, a we have, we have a lot of lawsuit for $750 million. Dollars. We, we have hey, to understand way, Jeremy, what bankruptcy is. You get an A for that question. We're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Dan, Daniel, uh, Daniel Hollis. He doesn't even have to do any homework. Yeah, no more. Semester. <laughs> get an A. What is your position on the elimination of the business tax? If in favor, how would you offset the cost to our city budget? If against, how would you provide a competitive advantage for small businesses in Los Angeles? Emmanuel? Uh, absolutely. That, that should have been done a long time ago. In fact, you're going to fear you're going to hear some of my colleagues up here actually say they want to abolish the, the business tax, but they, they've been in power for over 10 years each, and they could have led the way uh, before, but it hasn't been done, and that absolutely needs to get done. In fact, look, I'm, I'm the, one, the only one up here that, that's actually been an executive at a company that decided not to be in Los Angeles, but to be in Pasadena because they didn't want to pay that gross receipts tax, among other things. We need to address so it. You moved your business from L.A. to Pasadena? I, I did not. It was already done oh, okay. before I got so, there. So, uh, now, I now trust to, me, to make when, sure. when I got there, I, I was working on moving them back. And that's why I decided to run for mayor guys, so we can fix it. I know you guys it. are going to do a debate tomorrow in Pasadena. I don't know why, but you're going to be in Pasadena <laughs> yeah. tomorrow. It's for the broadcast for the airwaves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Look, and w the, the way we, the way we, what, the way we address the lack of revenue from these taxes. Right? We need to broaden the tax base and get our people back to work. We have the highest unemployment rate than any major metro area in the country. We need to get them back to work by providing private capital that can invest in our companies and providing the educational services that could be online or offline so that our workers are actually trained to get the jobs of today. Back to my technology experience, we had job openings every week that were unfilled. Our workforce needs to get trained and skilled. This is a skills mismatch that's happening across the country, okay. but specifically LA is one of the worst, and we need to address so, that. Councilman, just for the benefit of the students, yeah. how much does the business tax bring into the uh, About the $450 million. It's a big chunk of our budget, so this so has to be done. We have a structural deficit of $200 million. If we get rid of the city tax, excuse me, the business tax, we would have a structural deficit of $600 million if you did it in a way that there was never any new economic activity, and that's the central assumption. You see, okay. keeping this business tax in place, we just keep having a pie that shrinks. 165,000 jobs have left LA in the last 30 years. And we ask ourselves why, talk to business owners who say, I don't want to be in the city of LA anymore because of this gross receipts tax. <coughs> we used to have 150 new car dealers here. There's 50 now. 50. We haven't stopped buying cars. We just buy them in other cities, and they get the sales tax from parts and used cars and other things. So yeah, when we did you, business... Wait a minute. Don't you pay for your, the auto no, registration to your, where your all, home All is. the work that you have, the mechanics, about a million dollars, close to a million dollars per dealership a year, comes in other okay. uses that stay in those cities. So you can look at that across the board. When Ms. Gruel and I were the co-architects of the first piece of business oh, tax reform, more. of which I've done 11 other pieces since, everybody said that same thing. We're going to have less money. And so guess what? We had more of, business. Would you get rid of the business tax? Absolutely. And I have a plan that we're going to vote on actually in the next month in city council to do yeah. so in a responsible way. If the revenues aren't there, it stops until they are. But slowly it weans us off of this until we have a business friendly city that doesn't tax you even when you lose money. That's the LA of today. Con Controller Gruel? Yes. So as, as the only person up here who has a small business, who my, gran my grandfather started at 65 years ago, I've lived and breathed what it means to be a business owner in the city of Los Angeles. And as architect of business tax reform in 2006, there were many things that were part of that. First and foremost was, again, cutting the business tax by 15% across the board. Before I left the city council, I recommended we go to 25% and continue to wean ourselves off of it, because you can't immediately tomorrow take away $460 million from the city's budget. But it wasn't just about that. It was a gross, if anyone had a um, gross receipts of $100,000 or less, they no longer paid business tax. Hundreds of thousands of businesses have benefited from that and have come into the city of Los Angeles because of that. It was also about ensuring that we keep jobs in LA. We have in Los Angeles not runaway production, ran away production. I'm proud to have served on the California Film Commission in the state of California working on incentives to keep those jobs here because it's not just about the jobs in front of the camera or the back of the camera. It's all of the ancillary jobs that are part of it. It's all of those other jobs that some of us would, would like to have as you graduate from college. And so the importance of making sure that we are a business friendly city. When I sat and in the architect of business tax reform in the LA Times and we talked about the importance of business tax the city administrative officer sat at the table the year later because she told me we were going to bankrupt the city by doing business tax reform and Seven. guess what she said to me that day Wendy you were right and I was wrong 
If you're a business-friendly city, if you make sure that you get rid of that gross receipts tax, you're going to have more businesses come in the city of Los Angeles. Kevin, uh, obviously, I'm going to be against the gross receipts tax. There are two groups that get away with taking money off the top, the city of Los Angeles and the mafia. So it seems to me that it's something that we ought to be able to reform. But let me add something, because you have this, all this talk now of uh, suddenly we had these business-friendly candidates. They, they're, they're, they're not business-friendly council members, not a business-friendly controller. All right? They have developed a national reputation of being hostile towards the private sector. And I've got news for you. The public sector unions that are endorsing, especially Ms. Gruel, uh, they're not endorsing her because she's the business-friendly candidate. All right? She's going to do their bidding in City Hall, as we already saw today. Now, one of the things about the gross receipts tax, because... Dr. Guerra, I do not support the elimination of the business tax altogether. I join with Ms. Perry in that. What's, because of the hole in the budget that you talk about. Mm -hmm. I agree with Mr. Garcetti that we actually do see, and it's, I'm, I, I'm happy to see him take the more fiscally conservative view here, that by lowering this business tax, you will spur economic growth and all of the other tax revenues that come into the city from a healthy private sector, sales taxes, utility okay. users taxes, all those others. But Council we have to find a new way of calculating the business tax. Okay, Councilwoman. Dr. Guerra, before you start the clock, I just want to ask for a clarification. Uh, okay, so you Los Angeles. Answer within... 45 seconds. Okay, but I, and I noticed that <laughs> you're being very gracious yes. and letting people go way over time. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm keeping the extra time right here. Okay. Okay. And I, so far, I am within uh, five seconds of everybody, except for you. You have 45 seconds. Okay. Thank you very much. I do not support the wholesale elimination of the gross receipts tax. I do believe, however, that is, it is acceptable to target particular industries and eliminate the gross receipts tax and there to eliminate duplications in our tax code. I have done that in one instance, the taxation of mutual funds and mutual fund managers as a way of st stimulating more economic development and bringing more conventions here to the city of Los Angeles for mutual funds and their quarterly shareholder meetings to book more hotel nights. But again, that was a very limited circumstance. If we do not have a plan that is sound and based on sound accounting principles uh, to replace revenue lost, it would be irresponsible for us to eliminate the gross receipts tax in total. So I bet I, I do see a, a general consensus here that you want to somehow reform it, either piecemeal that we've been weaning ourselves out of it. So I think there's a consensus amongst all of you, although to a degree. Uh, Mr. Platas would like to get rid of it all at once. You guys talk a little bit about weaning it, and, and Ms. Perry's a little bit more restrictive in, in terms of that. Our next question is from uh, Nicholas. How will you address the unfunded pension mandate? It's uh, not just what I would do to address it, as I mentioned before. It's what we've done to address it on the record here and as elected officials. This pension reform problem that was projected would have bankrupted our city in five years when our business receipts went down, when the recession hit four years ago. It was projected we'd be between a billion and a billion two in terms of the deficit this year. We jumped into action and we negotiated pension reform. This is a difficult thing. Just folks, because I don't assume anybody knows the intricacies of City Hall. It's such a Byzantine place. When folks have a contract, you have to negotiate them to give something back. The only thing you can do with certainty is lay somebody off or furlough them. In times of emergencies, those are the only options you have. That's the leverage to bring somebody to the table. If we're not going to lay you off, if we're not going to continue to furlough you, what can you do to give money back? We did hundreds of millions of dollars of pension reform. I'm a proven tough decision maker, if necessary, will continue down that path. But I'm the only person on the stage who's delivered that face-to-face. -face. Controller Gruel. As a city controller, I've outlined every year in my financial report some of the challenges, not only in pension reform, but also uh, in some of the short-term solutions for long-term structural problems. I outlined earlier uh, tonight some of the ideas of things that we need to do, and that everything is on the table. Anyone who says we've done it, it's finished, um, is, is not looking at what the real future is when potentially 40% could be of our general fund could be for pension and for health care costs. I'm proud to have support not only from police and firefighters, but yes, also from business leaders, David Fleming and Joe Chiswick from here and many others that have supported me because they know we're going to sit at the table, roll up our sleeves, and have a real discussion. I sat down with Mayor Reardon and said, what, let's look at what kinds of pension reform we can do together and brought together labor leaders with him. That's the kind 
kind of mayor you want that's going to sit across the table and negotiate in good faith and ensure that we have an, a, a, actually a plan to address so, further pension um, reform? Mr. James implied that because you have the endorsements of unions that you would not be able to sit and negotiate these. How do you respond to that? Just absolutely incorrect. I mean, I have, as the city controller, every single day, I make somebody mad with the audits that I do. I audit many of the departments that are represented by unions and, in fact, have, uh, whether it be Department of Water and Power, Department of Transportation, Planning Department, Building and Safety. So, so, you so have I, have, I have a demonstrated, demonstrated a history of standing up and being transparent and holding people accountable, no matter who supports me, whether it be labor unions, business leaders, or others. Unfunded pensions, Mr. James? Mr. Guerra, uh, Dr. Guerra, did you select your salary when you were in negotiating with... Um, yeah, I did, but they said no. Okay, they said no. <laughs> well, see, that's, you made my point. The unions, are, they select their salary and their benefits. And they go in and they tell the elected officials that they put in office what those salary and benefits are. What Dr. Guerra described was called an arm's length negotiation. That's where the taxpayers actually have someone independent of these city employee unions to represent them. And that's what I would be. And that's what it takes. Because any of you, if you go in and you get to tell in the private sector your boss what your salary is going to be, unfortunately for everyone, the business is not going to last very long. And if we continue to allow the union leaders to tell our public officials, the fault here is the public officials, not the union leaders. And if we continue to allow the union leaders to tell them what their salary and benefits are, the city is not going to survive very long either. And that's, that's, why, that's so, why it takes but Kevin, the independence you, you know, to solve you, the problem. But the unions and their members and their leaders have the right to suggest what salaries they would want. It doesn't mean they're going to get everything, but they have the right to say, I sure want this, I want these working conditions, etc. And the taxpayer has the right to say, we can't afford it. And no one is stepping up for the taxpayer to say, we can't afford it. Because if they were, Dr. Guerra, we would not be talking about bankruptcy in the second largest city in America. It's embarrassing. It's bad for business. It's scary for our retirees. And it's just really not cool. Councilwoman. Is that a technical that term? It's our okay. job to cast the vote to make the decision as to what we need to do. And like I said earlier, everything short of getting the employees back to the table, convincing them that they have to give more on their pension and health care costs is just window dressing. Now, DWP is a place to start. It's not all unions. It's the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and the local that basically runs the Department of Water and Power here in the city of Los Angeles. So is that the IBEW, is that the only union at DWP or are there other unions? Well, there are other professional organizations and I, and I you know, I'm sure, yeah, there are other okay. unions represented. But that's the largest, that's the most powerful, that is the union that gives the most money to political campaigns. So it's a highly empowered uh, union. So, you know, Everybody respects the collective bargaining process, I'm sure. But let's, let's be realistic with each other. That's a place to start. You've got a department where uh, the employee salaries there are 40% higher uh, than city uh, employees. Uh, those costs, those pension costs, those health care costs. I said yesterday that the Department of Water and Power renewed its health care contracts without putting them out to a competitive bid uh, to see if we can get a better, and, and better have they, have, rate for the DWP employees. employees received the raise in the last couple of years? Uh, yeah, I voted against the last rate, a rate, a rate increase, but in every rate increase, which is why I've tried to disaggregate them on the public record so that the rate payers could see how much goes for pension, salary, health care costs, green energy, renewable yeah. energy. This is something that IBW is very resistant to because when you put the truth to power on the record and people see how their money is going to be spent, they're not going to like it. Mr. Platus. <clears throat> the... Uh, we, we need to, well, one, we need to start, stop demonizing unions. Right, look, my mom sitting right here to my left is actually uh, a labor union member, uh, SEIU, Local 99. Uh, they're doing their job and they're fighting for their members. Um, it's our leaders that need to ask the tough questions, understand the numbers, understand that there could be innovative proposals, and have opinions on them and make decisions. That's what we've been lacking in this city. Our politicians made decisions on numbers they didn't understand, or if they did understand them, they weren't 
willing to go up against any special interest. Okay? We, this is the fundamental, most important issue. In fact, if this wasn't it, uh, you know, the folks up here would be fine. But we need more bold, courageous leadership that's willing to address the most difficult issues so we stop cutting across the city. And we need to stand up for the communities that are getting the, mo the most cut. That means the most underserved communities across the city. That means after school programs, sanitation, public works, all the city services that are affecting Angelinos across the city. We need to stand up and say no more. The next question is by uh, Larnie, and we're going to start with you, Wendy. Hello. Our streets are a mess. According to the office of the CAO, we spend less and less on road repair. How do you propose to fix our roads, given our declining budget? I think she answered that already. She's going to drive on the river? or. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should, have, I should have kept that joke for that, road, you know, that question. Um, uh, look, uh, we in the city of Los Angeles um, have a, a, a huge challenge in our roads being uh, not able to anyone drive on them. I, I like to say that, you know, people say to me, we'll vote for you for anything if you pave Wilshire Boulevard. That's just an example of what people want to see in LA. Actually, actually we meant Manchester Boulevard. You meant Manchester, <laughs> okay. Just depends on where you live in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, look, a, a couple of things. One. It's being more competitive on the national level of the kinds of dollars we need for economic stimulus that the city didn't do a very good job when, and I audited and looked at how are we spending our money and getting the money into our streets. It is looking at, as many of us have talked about, uh, some of the Measure R monies that are coming forward because our streets are a form of transportation and if they are not uh, moving forward, if they're not fixed, we have a huge challenge. Similarly, it needs to be priorities and looking at, this, again, state, federal, and local dollars to be able to fix those streets. But it's also about our sidewalks and our, our infrastructure. We have not had an infrastructure plan um, in a very long time about how we're going to get to that strategy to make sure that we actually improve our infrastructure. Mr. So we're going to have the opportunity of looking at Measure R, looking at Prop A and, and B dollars that we have, and making sure that the money we do have we spend efficiently. Mr. James. For all the admissions here, this is the government of potholes, parking tickets, and high utility rates. <laughs> All right, And the fact that the city controller would come here and make a joke out of the fact that the river's paved and the, ro and the roads aren't, whose job has that been? The roads, second worst roads in the country. People wonder why their sidewalks are busted. Let me tell you, you know, I've lived here 26 years. And only in the last few years have, do we have these water mains uh, that, that, that bust and cause sinkholes so that we have 22-ton fire engines sticking out of the street in the city of L.A. You know why? We had infrastructure money to fix those problems. They took it. They took it to pay raises that we couldn't afford. I'll let you decide to whom those raises were paid. My point is not demonizing unions. My point is to save the jobs of these unions. They took the money from the special revenue funds and they drained them. The special parking revenue fund, the fire hydrant maintenance and tr uh, the fire hydrant maintenance trust so fund, street furniture fund to on fix sidewalks. The roads. Well, what, what I just said, Dr. Guerra, when we have pension reform and salary reform, we're going to be able to replenish the special revenue funds that they okay. raided okay. for roads, sidewalks, water mains, and the other things Council that they Councilwoman took. Perry, preparing our roads. That's right. Okay, first we start with Measure R and we back out and see what Measure R will cover and we see what's left. And then we talk to everyone. So just a, for Measure R is a countywide sales yeah, measure right. and the city gets a portion of that. That's correct. And it yes. can only use that money for transportation stuff. Well, transportation can be enhanced and can be aided and congestion can be reduced by paving people's streets. And that's streets perfectly and allowed with Measure R. Yeah, because okay. it makes traffic flow more right. easily and reduces congestion. After we see where we stand on that, I suggest that we follow a model that we're already using, street lighting districts, but wrap in public works improvements into that, and that includes street paving. The other suggestion or recommendation I, I, I would like to make is to look at the streets and to make sure that everybody who has participated in using those streets, the buses, uh, trucks, to be able to figure out a, a strategy to wrap all that into funding our repaving, that could be through an increase in the vehicle license fee. Okay. Mr. Plaitis. Um, look, our, our politicians need to come clean to the public and say, I made a mistake. We messed up. I need to reform the pension system because that's why we're cutting services. Every year it seems to be okay to chalk it up to budget cuts. Every year we're cutting sanitation, public works. We're not paving our streets. Our chief administrative officer that said every year we're spending less and less on paving our streets is correct. And in fact, the word bankruptcy came from his mouth, 
from the current administration that is raising the issue. And what is bankruptcy? I think some of our folks up here don't understand it. It's just when you don't meet liabilities and you ask for protection. That's what's happening in the city. We, we could have done it this year. We could have done it last year. But what they're doing is piecemealing, calling baby steps progress, and trying to cut the budget every year just to cover up for their mistakes. Let, let's talk some common sense for a moment about the streets. We have enough streets in this city to stretch to Paris and back, and then Denver and back. For 70 years, they have been underfunded. It's easy to throw slogans and to blame folks that it just happened suddenly in the last couple of years. It has been 70 years we have not funded our streets, and it's going to cost a lot of money to pave them all. But here's how we can do it. Measure R has a piece of it that's supposed to go towards paving, and Measure R drips in 1 30th a year for 30 years. We can take 26 years of that that is left and bond against it right now at such a low interest rate that at 3.75%, it's actually cheaper than the rate of inflation to pave a street, which is about 5 to 10% more each year. So do you want more roads done in the next few years for less money or fewer roads done over almost 30 years, like a house that slowly neglected begins to crack and crumble and we cost even more and do that for uh, more money? I think that would be clear and I put forward that plan to do that so that we could pave hundreds of miles of roads in the first few years that I'm your next mayor. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Haley Guerra. No relation. <laughs> My yeah, first she, she told me to say that. <laughs> um, you said that the number one priority for the next mayor of Los Angeles is jobs. If you were to be elected, what solutions will you propose to create jobs that would set you apart from the rest of the candidates? Hey, Kevin, yes, please. You have to create an environment for for business and for private industry to be here. We've all talked about the elimination of the gross receipts tax in some form or another and business tax reform. One thing that I add is streamlining the permitting process. It can't take 12, 15, 17 departments for you to get a permit to open a business or to improve your business. And that's what happens with the red tape in City Hall. So that's one thing that I would do that's different in addition to business tax reform. But there's something else that is very significant. And this is more procedural than it is substantive, but it's critical. I am the only candidate in this field that, would, that has the communication skills because of my media expertise and the independence to go around the city council. If the city council won't cooperate with me with my business improvement package, I'll go around the city council, put it on the ballot, and let the voters bring it to us. We'll get the signatures. Thank you. Uh, the last 11 years, I have had a relentless focus on making sure that we built catalytic projects here in the city uh, to bring back jobs to the city of Los Angeles. I was the representative and the steward or the shepherdess, if you will, of the LA Live, the JW Marriott, the Nokia Theater, two hotels on the north side of Olympic Boulevard to put 90,000 people over the last 11 years back to work. Now, I didn't do that alone. I did it collectively, working with the private sector, the public sector, stakeholders in the community, but I was strategic in making sure that every project that I ever worked on was tied to job creation through places like the community college, through Job Corps, through nonprofits like the Coalition for Responsible Community Development and PV Jobs, so that we reached deeply into people's communities and put people back to work. Mr. Platonis. Look, anyone that stands up here and says that a mayor creates jobs is naive. A mayor doesn't create jobs. A mayor needs to facilitate the environment so that businesses can actually grow and they create the jobs and a skilled workforce that is ready to take those jobs. I'm the only one that's been an executive at a technology company or the private sector in general that actually knows about this from a first-hand perspective. Jobs are going to be created when we invest in our workforce. Instead of doing Measure R, Measure A, or any other measure to patch up our budget because we're afraid of reforming our pension system, any of those measures should be invested in education and training in our neighborhoods for train, to train our people, to, to provide services for our entrepreneurs so that they can create companies and create the jobs and have a workforce that is skilled and trained for the jobs of today and tomorrow. Councilwoman. Councilman. Thank you. Whatever gender I am. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that I have a proven as, track record. As long as you create jobs. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't, that, people don't care. It's all right. um, I have a proven track record of bringing jobs to my district. Look at what Hollywood was 15 years ago. Silver Lake, Echo Park, 
Atwater Village. These are vibrant <coughs> places for small businesses that are independent and for new headquarters, folks like Technicolor who came back to the city of Los Angeles. How did we do it and how will I do it as mayor? One, by being more business friendly. We did reduce taxes and it helped companies come to Hollywood, the <coughs> gross receipts tax. We sped up the entitlements to get projects like the Technicolor building approved in six months. That was like a record at the time. Looking at making sure that we change the culture from a culture of here's everything you're doing wrong to here's how we're going to help you do it right. Second, job training. We have to look from the schools all the way through the community colleges and through graduates to job training programs. We've led the way, whether it's the aviation mechanics in Van Nuys that we're going to get rid of a program for 30 years, or whether it's our community colleges where we put job centers. We have to align those skills as well with making it more business friendly. I have other ideas, but my time's Controller. Up. That's gender neutral, so controller. <laughs> I just want to say, Kevin, I, I have some good communication skills, believe it or not. So we'll all get to be able to communicate with the public about we're going to be a very, very, I think, job-friendly city of Los Angeles. I have the unique experience of not only owning a family business, but working at an iconic industry dream and, and an iconic business, uh, DreamWorks Movie Studios, and also uh, working to ensure that we look at how to incentivize businesses in Los Angeles. There are four areas. One, it's all about incentivizing businesses and looking at those businesses we want to focus in on in Los Angeles, creating that growing that Silicon Beach, creating those clean tech corridors. It's about infrastructure and the kind of transportation dollars we're going to have, which not only will cre create a seamless transportation system, but also jobs. Three, it is about our workforce and ensuring that we have a skilled workforce of the future and connecting our community colleges and four-year universities to that. And lastly, the fourth is about creating hubs of economic activity. You all, many of you students, were probably recruited to come here. We want to recruit you to stay here and create around this university the kinds of incubators that are important so you have a job when you graduate and you're not worrying whether or not you're going to be able to afford to live in the city of Los Angeles. Next question is Yiralin. Recently, the mayor and city council voted in favor of local business preferences. What is your stance on giving local businesses preferences for city contracts and services? Councilwoman Perry. Uh, I believe in giving local businesses uh, business preference here in the city of Los Angeles because it's a way to stimulate our local economy, keep our dollars here and spending it here in the city and the county of Los Angeles, but the city because that's our, that is our charge. And I think it creates an opportunity for us to diversify our, our, our procurement base, our, our customer, customer participation, and to give independently owned and operated new businesses, startups, a chance to participate here in the local economy by doing business with the city of Los Angeles. Look, it's, it's not enough just to give a, a preference to business. I want them to be the best business and earn it on their merit. And the way we do that is by making sure our workforce is skilled and they have the capital to grow. That's what's going to allow a business to be able to compete properly, not just for city contracts of, in LA, but for contracts across the country. That's what we need to do. As mayor, I will create an entrepreneurship and skills training hub in every single council district so every council member gets some credit for it and make sure that these hubs attract capital, put investors together with entrepreneurs, provide a back office, whether it's you know, HR or other services that an entrepreneur needs or a small business needs so that they can grow and they can actually create jobs. That's what's needed. That's real economic development and we need to focus across the whole city, not just in Hollywood and downtown for developers, but business owners in our city that want to grow and want to contribute Emmanuel, to our city. So I'm taking your answer to say that you're not for local preferences? Yes, I said it's not enough. So, so, but so you're, yes. You're, well, so it's you, not enough. You're for that, you want to do more, or you're absolutely. not for local preferences? No, I'm for it, and we need to do okay. more so right. that those companies not just compete in L.A., All but right. compete Got across it. the country. Got it. Councilman. Uh, absolutely. I'm very proud to have supported my colleague, Paul Krikorian, who uh, wrote legislation recently to give additional points to local bidders on contracts for city things, whether it's selling paper or helping us, uh, you know, pave our streets. All of those things should be local and should get additional points. What I would do as mayor is add a couple things. One is I would bring our proprietary departments, which is the Department of Water and Power, Airport, and the Port into that as well. And I'd also look at giving some additional credit, if all else is equal, to folks who are hiring ex-offenders, as we see all these people coming out of prisons and jails, and our veterans, as we see so many of our service members come home. I'm proud to be a member of the United States Navy and the reserve component, and I have so many friends that are coming home. Half of the service members that are going to Los Angeles City College today are homeless, just to put that in context. So we need to make sure that they have jobs as well and have goals for hiring and lastly, summer youth jobs as well. I want to see those companies that are willing to give a youth that grow up in disadvantaged neighborhoods a summer job as well have additional points. Controller? 
Well, it's critically important to hire in Los Angeles. And I'll give you an example. When I was at the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the kinds of grants we gave and, and, and empowerment zones to make sure that there were actually requirements that you hired in LA, that you hired from the local community. I did an audit of our uh, proprietary departments and other city departments, and I called it the good fake effort, as someone told me, a friend of mine, not the good faith effort, because they were not at all hiring locally. They would hire a prime contractor and have minority and women-owned businesses that were part of the application and never saw a dollar. That will not happen in my administration. When I worked for Mayor Bradley, that's where it started to ensure that we hired in Los Angeles. But it's also about the future jobs that we're going to have through the MTA. Just the other day as I was talking and, and presenting at the uh, Move Los Angeles, um, working to get the transportation systems moving, uh, we have to fight the federal government to make sure that they allow us to hire in LA, hire employees from Los Angeles. They've worked out a way that they can do that in the, some of these contracts, but I will, as mayor, make sure that we have a stronger and, and more direct path in which to hire for those projects. Mr. James. Um, yes, I, I would obviously support it. Um, interestingly enough, um, they haven't in the past. It's nice to hear that on day one of year 13 in their term uh, that they think it's a pretty good idea. Um, there was a recent commission report, and I can't remember if it was the Commission on Revenue Efficiency, one of those commissions, that put out shocking numbers on just how little local business we spend with city contracts. They certainly are used to... It. They, they, it was the Commission on Revenue Efficiency. I'm kidding uh, you. Yeah, <laughs> you may have had some to do with it. was my audit, too. But, uh, well, so... Loosen well, up. And, Come on. And, well, uh, no, I'm not... You've, you, you're, you've done a good I, job of, of auditing. Uh, Ms. McGraw always makes the point that she knows uh, where the uh, lo bodies local are Local business preference, please. No, that's because she buried the bodies. Uh, <laughs> but, that now... <clears throat> But, my, but, but, not, but not in the me, L.A. River because it's paved. Let, right. <laughs> let, let, me, let me close on, 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 on my, my opponents. They're, they're certainly used to working with companies that contract with the city because for years, historically, that's where their political contributions have come from, from the companies that contract with the city. More specifically, most recently, ACS, which is the company that ran the ticket-fixing scandal in Los Angeles for years, was a major contributor to Ms. Gruel, and I'll close with that. Councilwoman. I started on the local. Oh, did you? I'm, yeah. I am sorry. But I could answer you, you it again. You can answer it again. What do you <laughs> think what, now? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. change yes. your mind. No, no, no. no. Let's, let's have the next question. What I'm going to do, though, now is instead of 45 seconds, uh, 30 seconds. Oh, boy. Okay? 30 seconds. All so right. basically a yes or no answer. Yeah, that's, you got it. So let's have, let's have the next question. Andrew. Hello. Hello. If you don't win, who of the remaining four candidates would you want to be mayor? Emmanuel. <laughs> repeat question, repeat question. I know, so we actually had this in another candidate yeah. forum. So we, we, oh, okay. So uh, let's, let's, see any, let's, let's see if any... Let's see if any... You go So what happened in the last forum is that everyone actually selected Jan Perry. Uh, so uh, you, you, you're saying Jan Perry? Don't give it away! <laughs> So, I, want, I, just, I want to keep us honest to see if it actually changes. Jan Perry? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Eric. I, I think actually everybody is qualified up here. I picked Miss Perry. If I had to pick one, it would okay, be Okay, Wendy. But everybody here is very qualified. I picked Miss Perry last time for her tenacity. Yeah. Kevin. Well, I'd have to think about it now. <laughs> <laughs> to, just because Wendy said Perry? Perry? No harm, no harm. I'm still with you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> ne next question. Uh, wait. wait what, oh, oh. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Believe me, Emmanuel so Playtez wants you to know. Wants you to know. Who would you? I said Emmanuel because he inspires me. Uh, he's come from so far, and it's nice to see his mother here in the front yeah. row. And he talks about his life and where he's come from and the fact that he went to Stanford. It makes me proud. It makes me proud that you've achieved that. And, and you're still young. Yeah, and we're still sorry that we gave you that rejection letter from LMU. Uh. <laughs> Okay, Candace. What, ple sorry. what pledges have you made to the specific groups that have endorsed your campaign? Eric, we're starting you. What pledges have you made? I pledged to Sierra Club that I would get us off of coal. Okay. Um, I made sure that we, when I talked to the National Organization for Women, um, who has also endorsed me, that we would make sure that we have uh, a program to look at gender uh, equality across our departments for girls and for women in this city. Um, I mean, I, I've been endorsed by so many folks for the De Democratic Party of San Fernando Valley. I promised I'd always stand up for the values that I believe in, for instance, opposing a rush to war in 2002 when others on the stage didn't. Um, those are the sorts of things that I promised. Okay. Wendy, pledges. 
Well, I, I have pledged that I am going to be transparent and accountable to the taxpayers of Los Angeles. When I've met with groups, whether it be the League of Conservation Voters or the police or firefighters or business groups, what I've said is, you will have access to me. What I've said is I will be a champion to make Los Angeles the kind of city I want to be. No promises that I couldn't keep. It was, in fact, what I said is I'm going to pledge to make Los Angeles a city that works. And that's the only pledge that I made. Kevin, what pledges have you made? Uh, I pledge to the Bring Hollywood Home Foundation that endorsed me to bring Hollywood home. <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. I also, I also pledge uh, that um, no, I, I published two position papers on this. Um, one of them, both in the Huffington Post, one of them pointing out the economic benefit to production remaining here in Los Angeles, not just to the entertainment industry, but to so many other industries that benefit as well. And I also published a position paper on the Los Angeles production model benefit uh, that we actually, oh, I'm 30 seconds on yes, that Yes, yes. Any, any other pledges? .com. Any other pledges? Uh, not to anyone okay. that endorsed me, no. Councilwoman. I've made no promises to any of the groups or individuals who have endorsed me other than to be focused, to work hard, and to make sure we put people back to work. But I will tell you the question, a litmus test question we were asked at a town hall at SEIU. They asked us if we would fire our city administrative officer. I pledged not to fire Miguel Santana because he was a good administrative officer to tell the public and the elected officials what we may not want to hear, but what we need to hear to make sound budget decisions and to put ourselves on firm financial footing. Manuel. Yeah, look, I, I don't believe in pledging to any interest groups uh, that, that endorse me. In fact, I've actually not wanted some endorsements uh, that, I, that, have, that have asked me if I wanted to you know, even fill out a questionnaire. Uh, what I have pledged, uh, in fact, I actually uh, announced it this morning, is I, I pledge to increase the graduation rate in four years <laughs> of our high schools by 50%. That is a serious pledge. Education needs to be a 24-7 job, and the mayor needs to be hands-on across City Hall, thinking about education nonstop. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Elizabeth. I'm going to start with you, Wendy. If you don't win this election and become mayor, how will you continue your public service? Well, I'm... I'm was proud when I uh, worked not only for DreamWorks Studios and uh, worked as, uh, on a number of boards and civic engagement. Um, my political career started when I worked for Mayor Tom Bradley and was an intern and part of his ma mayor's youth council. And so I think that as if, if I don't become mayor, but just so you know, I plan on becoming mayor, right. um, that I will continue to be civically engaged on the issues that matter to me, the environment, public safety, job creation, and education. And as a parent of an LAUSD student in fourth grade, I'm going to make sure that our educational system works and continue to use my voice as I have in the past. I will in the future. Kevin. I will continue to serve uh, publicly uh, the same way, uh, whether as mayor or not. Um, by, by focusing on city issues, obviously, as mayor, which I, too, plan on being. But as a broadcaster, as mayor, you can't do five nights a week and, or six days a week like I did uh, in my past broadcasting career that ended because of the campaign. But as mayor, I will go back into my old radio studio. I will sit there on the weekend for three hours on the weekend days and take calls and questions and solutions and answers from you. That's access to the mayor that no one else will provide the public, and I'm happy to do so. Councilwoman? I'm, I'm superstitious, so I don't like to talk about that other word. But if I had to make a career decision, I've always wanted to study to become a rabbi <laughs> and to reach out uh, beyond a, the walls of a congregation and to work and touch people in the most personal points of their lives a prison ministry, a homeless ministry, whatever you call it, an outreach, but to touch people in ways that are personal and profound, and that's what I would like to do. Emmanuel? What, what's the question again? Just if you don't become mayor, how mm -hmm. would you continue your public service? I, I'm not thinking about not becoming mayor, uh, but uh, on the spot, I will... Um, you can I, become a priest, a Jesuit priest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will consider. Uh, um, but... Uh, I will continue doing the work that I've always done, which is thinking of myself as a problem solver in any industry and focusing on our youth and creating more programs to get troubled youth back onto a path to be successful and contribute to their communities. 
You know, service is in my blood. It predates my time in office, and it will post-date my time in office. Um, I used to teach before. I didn't get hired by LMU, so I had to go to USC. Um, but it's who I am. And I'm going to continue to make this world a more just place, a place of greater opportunity, and in the words of Ignatius Loyola, to go forth and set the world on fire. Thank you. The next, uh, next question comes from uh, Ken. Uh, we're going to start with you, uh, Kevin. Go on out here, man. Come on out. We need new ideas in addressing the homeless epidemic, keeping the stigma around Los Angeles as the nation's homeless capital. If elected mayor, what new solutions will you bring to the table? Having personally lived at the Union Rescue Mission for two years while I finished high school at Helen Bernstein High School, which is in Mr. Garcetti's district, I am especially interested in hearing all of your responses. You know what? Let's make this a 45-second. Uh, uh, oh, thank yeah. you. 15 seconds more on that. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Kevin. As uh, I was in leadership for years at AIDS Project Los Angeles, and the homeless challenges that we faced for our clients that had HIV and AIDS um, was continuously uh, uh, one of the most important things that we did. I have published a position paper, just in the interest of time, I want to put it out this way. I've published a position paper on my website at kevinjamesformayor.com on homeless issues. One of the things I talk about, though, is making it a priority. We had this continuing and growing problem. And what we have in the city of Los Angeles are misplaced priorities, such that our city government will take a community federal block grant that was intended to help low-income, indeed homeless people, and take that money and redirect it to the Gensler architecture firm so they could, so they could uh, decorate their offices in the Jewel Box building. So it's a, they can afford to decorate their own offices. With due respect to them, they're very successful. So it's about priorities. And we can, one thing we can do at the city level, we have a number of city buildings that could easily be converted into space that could provide additional shelter for homeless, particularly homeless youth. That's something that we have to deal with in the gay community. Um, I'm an openly gay man, and we have uh, shockingly numbers of, uh, uh, of gay homeless youth that are on the street every night. Councilwoman? I represented Skid Row for about 11 years and uh, was an enormous advocate for building permanent supportive housing and working with the County of Los Angeles to obtain funding to have support and social services on site, psychiatric services, medical services, job training, realignment services right there on the ground floor for clients to walk directly downstairs and get help. So they didn't have to go, you know, great distances uh, to be able to get the support that they needed. You know, a lot of people talk about solving homelessness or eliminating homelessness. There will always be frail people, frail and elderly people, people who are at risk, people who suffer from mental illness in our communities, and we will have to provide for them. That's just the reality of our situation. But we need to continue to refine, to build housing, to make sure that it is funded so that people can get help, stay on their meds, get physically healthier, mentally healthier, healthier, and to be able to live a life in the mainstream that is self-sustaining. Emmanuel? Yeah. Look, we, we need to start giving uh, uh, lip service to providing services for homeless and actually make sure that we don't cut any of those programs and enhance them and, and do more so that any person that's homeless can have a bed, can have a roof. And then every single one of those services needs to be tied to some kind of re-entry program into society or some kind of education or training program. And there's, there are a number of social entrepreneurs that are out there trying to do these things. Those are the folks that I will incentivize in our city. And look, this, the bigger issue here is poverty in general. And this, this is a very personal thing to me. I was very lucky that we weren't homeless, but we moved around 10 times before I was 10 years old with a single mom and my sister. I mean, this stuff is happening every day in LA, and we need to address it and stop giving it lip service. Council member. I might go a little bit over on this one, I'm just warning you. I just want, want to say, that Kenneth's story it really resonates with me. There was a woman who I ran into outside my district office in Hollywood about a year and a half ago who came up to me. I recognized her from a community meeting in the district. We started speaking in Spanish, and I said, how are you doing? And she was there with her teenage son. And um, she said, not very well. I lost my job a couple months ago. And I just hit the streets last night. I was in a shelter in a different part of the city, and my son goes to school at uh, Helen Bernstein High School. And I spent last night in a shelter, and he couldn't get to school today. i got to get him back into school. So I know how personal that is, and we immediately got her into some housing. She's working now again, and she's back on her feet. 
But I have said in this campaign, I won't just manage homelessness, I will end homelessness. And to be clear, there's a plan that the United Way put forward to do that in this city because we know how to do it. You do it by humanizing, customizing, and building supportive services. Humanize, learn the names of these folks and recognize who they are so that we know who they are as we do in Hollywood. The Hollywood Forward Initiative has taken over 150 people off the street. They usually fall back on with a 70 or 80% fallout rate. Not one has gone back. Customize. LGBT homeless youth are different than emancipated foster youth. They're different than veterans. We have to know what those segments are. And then third, do what we've done in my district and Ms. Perry has done as well. Builds permanent supportive housing. Housing with services right there that keeps people in that housing and doesn't just give them services on the street, but permanently gets them off. Controller. Thank you. Um, this is an issue that I've worked on uh, since I worked for Tom Bradley in, starting in 1983. I was the Deputy Director of the Interagency Council on the Homeless when I worked for President Clinton at HUD. The homeless do have faces. They're people, homeless families. Whether it be the LA Family Housing Shelter, which I have worked with over the years from its inception when it was just at the Fiesta Motel and changed into a permanent housing, transitional housing. But it's about the wraparound services. To me, it is criminal that any veteran that has served our country is homeless and has nowhere to go. It is criminal that at the West LA site, the Veterans Administration, that there are empty buildings that the Veterans Administration won't allow us to use for homeless services. That is criminal. When you see the number of people who are living in their cars, we just finished a homeless count in the city of Los Angeles, and how many people there are. That's not an accurate number because there's a lot of people who just want to be hidden. But we need to focus and have re attention again. And it is about prevention, making sure that someone who may lose their job has an opportunity to maybe keep that housing for a few more months <coughs> while they get back on their feet. Because it costs us a whole lot more after they get on the street than if we kept them in that housing. It is about permanent housing and making sure that we have greater numbers of affordable housing in the city of Los Angeles and make it a priority and yes, have the housing trust fund. And most importantly, it's looking at the chronic homeless that are on the streets of Los Angeles. Right now, you may not see someone homeless when you're driving Kevin. down the street. I'm just going to finish the one okay. driving down the street. But they're there and there's a face. And we cannot put our heads down on our pillow at night unless we recommit ourselves as I have throughout my career, to ensure that no one is on the streets of Los Angeles. Kevin. Um, I started. You want me to? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, let's have a question from Kay. Again, we're going to go back to 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, Eric, Wendy, Kevin. Yes, sorry. We'll make up Emmanuel. for Emmanuel. Because Jam Perry right now is getting an A for efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 30 seconds. If there is only one thing the voters could know about you, what would you like them to know? Okay, one thing. I heard that in the question. <laughs> 30 seconds. What I want you to know about me is this. I continue to fight for people even when there are no cameras and when there is no one looking because all I want to do is push people forward, make sure that families have stability in their lives, People have jobs, a place to work, a way to get there, and a way, a choice in the manner in which their children are to be educated. Emmanuel? That was 20 seconds, by the way. Great. Emmanuel. <laughs> I understand the problems of this city firsthand, and I'm unafraid to deliver on the solutions that we must at this day and age without any interest groups behind me. Eric. I don't just t talk about my future plans that I deliver and I've made tough decisions and look what I've been in charge of. In my district, which has had an incredible turnaround in those neighborhoods of Hollywood and Silver Lake and Echo Park and Atwater Village, two-thirds drop in crime, tripling the number of parks, putting an after-school program in every single school, helping the school district double the number of schools, um, seeing a huge rise in, in economic output. Those are things I like getting things done. It's about a record as well as promises in the future. Wendy. One thing I want people to know about me is that I'm tough, that I'm going to fight and I'm going to be independent and no one tells me how, what to do or how to do it. Jennifer Granholm, who was the governor of Michigan, had the saying, do not confuse civility with weakness. I'm going to be a tough mayor. I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to hold people accountable because that's what the taxpayers deserve and that's what I'm going to do as the next mayor of Los Angeles. Kevin. 
I want people to understand and to know my independence and my willingness to fight in the face of adversity. I stepped in to the AIDS fight in the 80s. I came from a community where middle age was 16 or 17 years old. The stigma in the 80s and the 90s of the AIDS epidemic and fought it and pledged that I would for the rest of my life and will continue to do so. And that independence and that willingness to fight against and fight in the face of adversity is what we need with the challenges that we face in Los Angeles today. We have the next question from Hobie. Hi. We are in Westchester and many residents are concerned about the airport modernization. Do you support? So that means that they're all in favor of modernization, those that clap, because that's what she said and you guys all clapped. Go ahead. Do you support moving the northern runway 260 feet closer to Lincoln Boulevard? Emmanuel. Look, I'm, I am for modernization. I am running for mayor of a world-class city and we need a world-class airport. However, we shouldn't just be thinking that this airport is the only airport we should be using. We need a regional plan. But I am for modernization and we need to move forward. However, if there's any negative impact on the community, we need to make sure that that's paid for. And if the community at the end of the day does not want it, then we shouldn't do it. But I am for the modernization okay, plan. So I think the airport commission is actually voting on that today. Mm -hmm. and it, well, we already did. Okay. And, <laughs> Commissioner Velasco, what did you, and what was the vote? <laughs> I don't the vote, one in nine. No, no, Commissioner Velasco. The vote was, I was there voting. The vote was six to one. The one, me, one voting no on moving the runway. Okay, so <laughs> the commission voted six to one to move the runway 260 feet. Are you in favor of 260 feet? The, the commission voted for it. I'm in favor of it. Now the commission has work to do, and we need to figure out how any negative impact is paid for and work with the community to address their concerns. Council Member Garcetti, in all, favor? All joking aside, they are clapping because they do support modernization. In fact, this community has worked very hard on 95% of modernization, which this community deserves in traffic reductions, in a better airport for everybody who lands there. And I've said consistently, I'll say it tonight, I only support that if the case cannot be convincingly made that you can get efficiency in any other way. And I've heard a lot of convincing cases from this community that there may be ways to do that without moving. Yeah, but if the commission's voted for it and it's going to the city and by the time you are mayor, it's there on your desk, the commission has voted for it, the council has voted, would you support it or would you veto it? Oh, you'll get it earlier than that because I'll be having okay. to vote on it as, as well, mayor. Well, will you but vote I'm, for it? I'm talking to the community right now to see if that case can be made to, to, for the commission right now, which has said now six to one, that it has to be done why that isn't the case. And I've heard convincing things from the community that, pro that there are ways to get efficiency without having to move that runway. Okay, so is that a yes or a no? It means I'm still talking to the community. Oh, so it, is our, it is our responsibility to listen to the community and okay. to make sure. Controller. There are three things that I've said we have to consider when you're looking at the modernization of LAX. It is about safety and competitiveness and, yes, neighborhood concerns. I've been at Val Velasco's house. Um, I've been at other houses that are there next to this airport and seen those planes who are supposed to be going straight curve off to, to the right. Um, I believe that in any decision that is going to be made, and yes, although the commission voted today, there are a lot of steps along the way. This is the first in the EIR process and issues. I'm someone who has been, as a city council member, a controller, that I have everyone at the table, and the neighborhood has felt very, very okay, comfortable. 260 I, 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 feet. I'm, will, you let, will you let me No, no it's, 30, it, it's past 30 seconds. Oh, so, that went quick. Yeah, um, yeah. So I your find mayor... A, yes. It's past the council, it's past the commission, it's past the council, it's on your desk, and they've said, we're going to move it 260 feet. Would you sign it or veto it? I've said, and I'm very similar actually with Mr. Garcetti has said, which is the neighborhood will have a say and sitting at the table and doing that and having the discussion. So from my perspective, it is about having the neighbors there at the table and okay. making that decision. Kevin. A world-class city deserves a world-class airport. We need to improve our terminal experience, obviously, for travelers that come in and through our city. It's the first thing many people see when they come to Los Angeles. It's the last thing many people see when they leave Los Angeles. But what I need to know as mayor is whether or not we can get to the economic, the safety goals that we have set for the airport in any other way 
other than moving the north runway 260 feet. So today as mayor, no, I'm not there yet. Okay. Councilwoman. If I was mayor today, I would tell you that I would send it back for more work and I would veto it. But I'm not mayor today. I've been through some thorny, thorny issues in this city, major projects that have been approved. I always follow the process and do all of my discussion, my negotiation, my vetting on the public record. I'm going to go out there to the site. I'm trying to schedule an appointment now so I can get out there and just sit there and look at the site. I've seen the site plans. I've seen the, the renderings, but there's nothing like being there to see how it directly impacts people's communities, the sound, the noise, the smell. That's what I'm going to do so that I can make a decision that is based in reality. Do Dr. Gary, yes. I didn't use all my time, my 30 seconds, and I just want to raise a point that it these is are- It is so you got 10 seconds. These are our elected officials right here. They've been elected officers for 10 years. They've had enough time to study or to talk to the community or to go to the site. So they need to make decisions. And even if they're unpopular, they need to face up to them. And this is exactly so you said, the problem in So I got, here's what I got. You said yes. yes. There's two no's that would veto it and, and two maybes. Okay. So that's where we are right now. So let's get the next question from Semhar. Okay. Thinking about the March ballot, do you support Proposition A, the sales tax increase, also known as the Neighborhood Public Safety and Vital City Services Funding and Accountability Measure? No, I do not. I think that uh, the time we're trying to make the city more business friendly, why would we make it more business friendly by reducing or eliminating our gross receipts tax and then raising our sales tax? Why would somebody buy a big screen TV here when they can go just over the border and get it for cheaper? I think that we cannot tax and cut our way out of this. We have to grow our economy. We have to look at those drivers for future industries that are here. Have somebody as mayor with a proven track record of increasing job growth, even in the midst of a recession, where my district is up 5% in jobs while the city is down 10%. That has to be the way forward, not a sales tax. Controller. Uh, no, I, I'm not supporting a, on a, a sales tax uh, because we can't tax our way out of the problems. And the public believes we have not done enough to ensure that we've tightened our own belt. They don't believe we've done enough, um, and, and I agree with that, that the city, uh, council, and mayor need to do more in being business friendly. And I also agree that when you purchase, we just gave a tax incentive to these car dealerships where we said we're not going to have gross receipts tax anymore, business tax. And what's going to happen? Turn around, and we've increased the sales tax. They're going to go to the surrounding cities. I vote no on A. Kevin. Obviously, um, I'm going to uh, be opposed to the sales tax increase. I signed the ballot opposition argument. Only Ms. Perry on this stage joined me in signing the opposition argument. Um, we must be four weeks before an election because Ms. Gruel and Mr. Garcetti are, are now opposed to a tax. Um, but we in, 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 in addition to that, um, I, you know, sometimes you want to bring props to debates, and I, I wish I'd brought my yes on A slate that I got yesterday. Yes on Measure A because it's got Ms. Gruel's picture prominently there. So they might want to know that she's against it. I'm against Councilwoman. it. Councilwoman. I'm against uh, sales tax increase. When it was brought forward in city council, I think we just completed an election, and at the state level, the sales tax uh, was already increased. I want to create new taxpayers people who have jobs and places to live, not more taxes. We can put people back to work so that they can pay more taxes and bring a recovery to our local economy. So I oppose it. And I Iman opposed it on the ballot also. Emmanuel. Yeah, I, I absolutely oppose it. It's a sales tax. It's regressive and it impacts poor people the most. It's something that if I was in city council, we'd be proposing better solutions. This is absolutely to allow it to get proposed. We need to make sure that we are investing, especially in the most underserved communities, and create solutions that are actually getting people who are hungry to work back to work by investing in education and training. What I want to propose is that we actually go to the private markets and actually get debt and equity and invest in the small and medium-sized business within our city so that they can create jobs. That's how we're going to broaden the tax base and actually be able to start uh, bidding, getting us on a path to okay, solvency. Okay, we're coming very much to the end. We have one last question, and we're going to allow for a minute and 30 seconds to uh, answer. Uh, Kim? Hello. Jim Newton of the LA Times has asked you this question previously. And he's also written about your answers. So for the audience today, could you please re-answer for us? Imagine it's 2021 <laughs> and you've been mayor for eight years. How will LA look because of your work? Controller Wendy Gruel. Okay. 
Thank you. I'm going to be a mayor for all of Los Angeles so that no part of the city is left behind. I'm going to be a mayor that makes sure that it doesn't matter what your zip code is, you get the same services. Whether or not if you call 911, you get that ambulance and that paramedic at the same time no matter where you live. That you can go to a park and not have to drive 10 miles to get a safe and clean park. That you have a city that is able to help ensure that everyone has a job in Los Angeles and they have an opportunity when you graduate from LMU and other places. To be a mayor that ensures that we have a transportation system that, yes, connects from A to B to C and gets you where you want to go. To make sure that we've invested in our infrastructure and, yes, we've invested in our people. To be a city where our educational system does not have a 50% dropout rate and that kids can get a good education like I'm fighting for my son at LAUSD. It's going to be a city that people can achieve their hopes and dreams and that the Hollywood is here back in Los Angeles and that we have the kinds of technology, jobs that are so important and we created those hubs of economic activity. It's a city where we're able to create good family wage jobs and a city where we can ensure that we have the kind of environment that all of us can know that we've saved more park space and that we're not the worst, you know, lowest number of parks in, the, in a region than we have in comparison to other states and other cities. And lastly, we're going to be a city that people like my son can live next door to his mom, as he said in, the, in his years. He, he said that uh, when he grows up, he'll live next door to me for the rest of his life. And I want him to be able to do that. He'll change his mind when he's a teenager. Yeah. But right now, he can get a good job, that he get a good education, that he doesn't spend all of his time in traffic, and that he, too, can achieve the wonderful dream that I have to be able to serve the city of Los Angeles. Mr. James. On jobs, I told Jim Newton that by then, there will be fewer, many fewer, space available signs around Los Angeles. I told him that on the budget, we would, yes, have achieved real pension reform, and we will be balancing our budget. On infrastructure, we would have many more sidewalks repaired and roads paved. On education, the LAUSD would have implemented the trade tech diploma that I've called for to give students a choice, because not every kid is college bound. Some kids need to go to work right out of high school and we want them to have the skill set to do so. And the choice, those are jobs that are right here in our community. I told him that Los Angeles would be a cleaner city, less graffiti, a city that has the beauty that we know it can have and that it deserves. That our city government would no longer have a national reputation for corruption that public transportation projects would be much better. We would have a green line that goes all the way into the airport. Yes, my luggage has wheels on it, but I do not want to drag it a mile and a half to get to the airport. I also told him that we would have good government reform and we would have safe streets because our LAPD would be spending more time in the community than they are behind a desk doing what is often unnecessary paperwork. Our fire department response times will be at the national average, and I did tell him that we will have a city engineer that knows how to make a manhole cover level with the street. <laughs> it's in the story. Councilwoman Perry. After eight years with me as mayor, you will have a city where as college students, you'll be able to move out of your parents' house before you're 30 years old. <laughs> You will be able to find a job, a job of your dreams. It may be in renewable energy, it may be a green job, it may be in the creative arts, it may be in biomedical, but you will have choices. I care about that because I have a 21-year-old daughter. And I've already told her in this economy, economy where we are now, you may have to get two jobs. I want to get it to the point where you get one job and that's enough for you to be able to sustain yourself and to build a life because you won't have to drive a car all the time. You might not even have to buy a car. You may be able to have a, a zip car or use your bicycle or take public transportation. For those of us who are older, we may be too set in our ways, but the future 
is in your hands because if we build a transportation system for you that is easy, that is accessible, and that is available, you will take it. You do not have the biases and the prejudices that older people have, and we will be able to move forward. That's why I have told Emmanuel that I do admire him because he does represent his generation and the hopes and aspirations and what you're able to accomplish because you, you grew up with the internet, you grew up with computers, you, you don't have any hesitation about gathering information and creating your own solutions to problems. So that's the kind of city that I want to build. And as we live longer, we live healthier, and we live in an independent manner, we need to make sure that you have all the options that we have had and more. Emmanuel. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Councilmember Perry, for what, what you said about me. And, and yes, we do need people uh, like me in City Hall. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, now um, it's a different way of looking at things. If you've heard me tonight, you've heard me propose real solutions. Right? Because the City Hall, with me as mayor in eight years from now, is going to be filled with problem solvers that are empowered to make decisions. We need to dream big and make our city the envy of this country. Make our city a leader, a model for how job creation should happen. Not by the, the mayor hiring more people, but by having businesses with the ability to thrive. By allowing technology companies to be here and innovate and create. As mayor, I will have a team of data scientists that report directly to me. So we actually make sense of all the data available, because there's tons of it, but we, we don't have a sense of it. And we need to allow the entrepreneurs to use that data so that we can better deliver solutions to our citizenry. And we need to change the mindset and make it education 24-7. Graduation rates, by the end of my mayoral terms, will increase by 50%. I will go to the private markets and make the case for investing a billion dollars in our most impoverished neighborhoods. I'm talking about South LA, the East Side, Pico Union, Westlake, Silmar, Pacoima, the areas where we have the highest unemployment rates. That's the future of LA, and we will do it if we bound together, address the solutions, and elect real leaders in City Hall that are unafraid of making the tough decisions to take us to new heights and realize the potential that we actually have. We deserve better. Council Member Eric Garcetti. Eight years from now, when I finish my time as your next mayor, I want us to believe in Los Angeles as deeply as I did growing up here. I want that worldwide buzz to be back. When people hear you're from LA, they go, wow, you're so lucky to be from LA, to be living there. That it's a place of innovation where new companies come. And you know what? It's a place that is livable again. It's a place where creativity lives, which emphasizes the weather, the people, the terrain that we've always had, but also the creativity that is here. And what I see eight years from now in the city is what I saw 11 years ago in my district, a place that had no infrastructure, a place that was unsafe, that had no businesses, no parks, no new schools in 30 years, no job training programs, no transit options, graffiti everywhere. I love hearing what my colleagues are talking about up here because guess what? Graffiti's down there by 80%. We've increased parks by threefold, not from one to three, but from 16 to 47 in the smallest district in the city. We've led the city in job growth the last two years. We've shown what main streets are about again. We've given transit options by extending bike paths and having zip cars already there in Hollywood. By looking at schools and helping the school district double the numbers and put an after school program and using city funds in them. But most of all, I want a city hall eight years from now that returns your call that answers your question, and that fixes your problem. That is the greatest legacy that I can leave behind. Well, I have one more question, and I invite you to step to the front of the podium. You, you don't need the mic. It's a yes or no, and it's a simple one. So, so um, if you are in a runoff election, do you pledge to come back to Loyal Marymount University? <laughs> Absolutely. It would be my honor. Definitely. Of course. I pledge if you feed me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't make pledges, I'll pledge this one. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I want you all to give this a great round of candidates an applause. That was Panama, man. Two hours. Two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Like our, your yeah. interview.
Hey, how are you holding up? <laughs> this is a special for your son. Oh, fabulous.